Welcome to the Chess Angle. My name is Neil. I am the founder and director of the Long Island Chess Club in New York. This podcast is all about chess, tournament play, and improvement at the amateur and club level. Be sure to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at the Chess Angle. This podcast is sponsored by Chessable. I know many of you are already using Chessable, but for those who haven't yet, their courses are phenomenal. Chessable uses science-backed learning and the concept of spaced repetition to increase retention and ensure that you're learning the material. Check out chessable.com today. There is a link in the show notes. So first, some housekeeping. We have two more episodes this season, not including this week. This is episode 38 And then for next week, I will probably fly solo again. And then I do have a special guest lined up for episode 40, which will be our season two finale. That should be great. We're scheduled to record in about a week or so. So barring any cancellations or scheduling conflicts, that should be awesome. So we'll end it with a special guest. And it's funny, I probably need to step it up a little bit as far as getting guests I do like the balance between the solo episodes and the interview episodes. I think that makes the content interesting, but it's funny. I may have shared this. I always envisioned this show originally. This is how I started the podcast as really a solo venture. I kind of wanted sort of like a Rush Limbaugh type of setup where it was just one person. For those of you who may not know, uh, maybe you're not from the States, Rush Limbaugh Uh, He passed away. He was a radio commentator who made a very successful career out of just being a solo act, because usually on radio, you'll have a guest, not comparing myself to him in any way, but just that solo format. And you'll notice I didn't have a guest until episode 20 when I had national master Tim Mirabile. But, you know, my thought was, I don't want to have guests. I don't know. It seems like it's too much. But, you know, that's how it works with a creative process. You start doing it, and then I realized, uh, yeah, I I need to have guests. I want to have guests. So originally the podcast was about the Long Island Chess Club and my own personal journey as a player and tournament director, some words about improvement and my thoughts on that, just sort of my own experience in playing at clubs and in the amateur chess scene you know, again, as a player, as a TD, that whole thing. But then it kind of morphed into some other things. But that's how it started. But now, of course, we talk a lot about improvement, about the amateur level versus the grandmaster level. And we have guests. We have game analysis where I kind of discuss what's going on on the board for my games. So it's a good mix of content. I'm sure as it grows, I'll come up with some new ideas as well. But very happy with the way things are progressing. And I really appreciate everyone's support and positive comments because it really does mean a lot. So now let's get into this week's topic. So let me know if you relate to this. You have an impressive collection of chess books, which you show off all the time and people are jealous of it and you post photos of it on social media You study all the time. You might even have a very regimented study plan. You play and you burn a hole in your wallet buying all these online courses. You're doing everything that you think you're quote unquote supposed to do, but your rating is not commensurate with that. Your rating is not going anywhere. It's plateauing or it's decreasing. Maybe this is over a period of weeks, months, or even years where your rating is just not increasing. So what's that all about? That's what we're going to look at today. I'm going to share some thoughts based on my own experience as a player, as a tournament director, as someone who observes amateur games every week. want to share my thoughts. I think I'm going to cover some things that some other people haven't. Some of these things I'm sure they have, but I think a lot of the books miss some of this stuff. Or if they mention it, they don't emphasize it enough. Now, this is going to be in the context of OTB or over-the-board tournaments. 
that's really the heart of this podcast. It's really about playing live games at the club level. You know, that's really what the chess angle is all about. Of course, we talk about internet chess and other things. If it has anything to do with adult improvers and amateur improvement, whatever word you want to use or term, and playing at the club level, that's what we're about. But as far as sitting down against a fellow amateur at a live tournament, that's what we're about here, okay? So I want to look at some different perspectives. Now, this is not going to be a poor me thing or a Debbie Downer. I'm not going to get dark. I'm going to try to keep it light and, you know, almost fun. And by fun, I put that word in quotes in a compelling way. All right, we're not going to sit here sit here and, you know, oh, poor me, my rating's not going up. No, I, it's a great game. I just want to give you some things to think about because as I give you this list, even if just one of these things is an issue, that's enough to prevent your rating from increasing. All right. Now, before I get into it, I want to talk about online chess, which, as you know, for me, that's like a whole different thing. All right. I am a chess.com person. I do play online, not that much. All right. But online chess is not real chess. It's not the same thing as playing in person. I think it's okay. I think it's a good tool, but it's definitely not the same. When I sit down at the club every week and you're facing a live opponent and, you know, you're talking to the guys and it's the whole community thing, it's just, it's just not the same. Like actually going to a chess club or a chess tournament, it's just not the same as, you know, sitting in front of your computer in, you know, a shorts and a t-shirt and you're just looking at a screen and it, it's just not the same. And the problem with online chess, no matter how disciplined of a person you might be, it has a very addictive nature and people don't stop playing when they should and their reading just decreases, right? Because I'm going to share a little scenario that I'm guessing many of you have experienced, right? You have like an hour or two before bed, you have to work the next day. Oh, I'm just going to play a few games, right? I'm just going to play for 45 minutes. And then before you know it, you know, three hours goes by, all right? And, you know, I'm never going to play again. I'm going to cancel my account because, you know, what happens is you get so frustrated that you lose and it just becomes a bad experience. Now, what should be happening is maybe you win a few games, you lose a few, you're doing okay. As soon as you start to lose a few games, because let's face it, you know, you can only play so much at once. When you see that you're slipping or you're getting tired, you need to walk away. But people don't. And it's that just one more game syndrome, right? I have to win the last game or, you know, I don't want to, I want to win three in a row or something like that, or I want to get my rating back. And then, you know, you're almost like a gambler trying to recoup, you know, his losses, that type of thing. And that's one of the problems with online chess. Like for me, I don't play online that much, but I consciously choose to not play at night because I know that there's a chance that I might get into that sort of like spiral. Like you go on sort of a chess uh, like bender or something. I don't know what the right term is, but online chess is a different entity, whereas for an actual live tournament where you're playing a classical game, it's just more disciplined inherently, like without you even having to try, just the fact that you're driving there, it's a long game, you have that discipline. Whereas with online chess, you can easily lose that discipline. So I'm not really going to address the rating issue with online chess for that reason, just because it's, it's not, it's not real chess. And you know, with online chess, I don't consider those ratings to be really accurate or representative of your strength. So that's a whole separate thing. So we're going to be talking about live games over the board tournaments. And there are six things that I'd like to share that I want you to think about that may be reasons why your rating is not increasing. Now, I'm not preaching here. I'm not saying that what I'm saying is correct or that it's Bible and that this is somehow some major, you know, unprecedented list that no one else has thought of. I'm just sharing my thoughts, again, as a player, as a tournament director, and as someone who has seen, you know, hundreds and hundreds of amateur games over the years. I'm even going to share some things from the club from the other night at some point. But these are six things 
that I want you to think about because your rating stagnation, I guess, it may have nothing to do with your actual knowledge and your studying. It may be one of these other things where it's more about tournament conditions or just the playing environment, things of that nature, where it has nothing to do with, let's say, necessarily tactics or positional things. But you'll kind of understand what I mean as I explain it. All right, so let's get into number one, okay, the first reason why your rating may not be increasing. So number one is that you are playing in the wrong types of tournaments, specifically the major weekend marathons. I think for a lot of players, that's one of the best ways to actually decrease your rating. I think you're much better off playing at the local clubs where it's one classical game a week. Now, a cynic's going to say, well, you're just saying that because you run a club and you're a tournament director. Not really. I started my own club and am more of a club player because I was going to these major events and just not doing well. So even if I weren't running my own club, I would still play at another club just because the way these tournaments are organized, in my opinion, okay, it's not normal to play that much chess in such a short amount of time. You know, to play five, six, seven or more, you know, three or four hour games or more over the course of like three or four days. There's just no way cognitively you're going to be, you know, at your top level that you're going to have your A game for each game. And it just doesn't make sense. And I've mentioned this before, you know, if you have a game where it goes down to the wire, it's a tough, brutal game, and then you lose, or maybe you were winning the whole time, like it's still a very long game that goes deep into the end game, but you're winning and then you make that one blunder and then you lose, like you have to then shake that off and within like 45 minutes, maybe less, sit down and play another game that could last several hours. But like, it's not normal. You know, it's not normal to just play that many games at once. That's just me. And in addition, you're also going to be facing a lot of kids where their ratings have not caught up to their actual strength. Now, there are a number of reasons for that, but you have a lot of kids who are listed as quote unquote 1,000 or quote unquote 1,200, and they're easily playing four or 500 points higher than their rating. Like, this is a thing now. We had someone at the club just the other night, a very, very strong player, young child. She was listed with a rating of 1,100, okay? She was not 1,100. Okay, she beat a 1600 player and you could tell just observing the game. I mean, she was making some very, very good moves like tactics, mating nets, you know, 1100 players, you know, we all know generally don't play that way. You know, something's going to be hung. There are going to be mistakes, you know, a a pawn's going to drop, you know, something like that. They'll miss a mate. But when you go to these major events, you see those types of opponents all the time. Okay, and I think for a lot of adults and adult improvers, those aren't the best conditions for you because not only do you have opponents like that, but again, you're just playing a sort of abnormal amount of chess over such a short time. That's just my take. Now, some of you are going to say, well, you know, there are no chess clubs near me. What choice do I have? In that case, that I'm going to be honest, I don't really have the best answer for you. You know, I'm not going to say start your own chess club because I know most people aren't going to do that. But, you know, there's got to be a local club somewhere. Or if you insist on playing in these major tournaments, maybe take a couple of buys, like spread it out so you're not playing two games in a row. But then I know the issue with that is that, you know, you're paying all this money and, you know, you're going there to play. So if it's a seven round event and you take like three buys, you're only going to play four games. I mean, I get it, but... Most people who go to these tournaments generally don't do well. So I think, and, you know, maybe I'm in the minority. Who knows? I'm sure people are going to disagree with what I say. I mean, I expect that. All right. That's what makes the world go around. But I think these weekend marathon tournaments 
are not a good choice if you're really concerned about increasing your rating. Now, some people may thrive in that environment. If you're going to these events and your rating's shooting up, then just ignore me and do it. All right. But I think for more people than not, I think it's an issue. That's why I'm mentioning it. All right. Let's go to number two, the second reason why your rating may not be increasing. Number two is that you are not thoroughly reviewing your games with a chess engine. All right. It's one thing to go over it with your opponent, but you really need to analyze your game thoroughly with a chess engine. That doesn't mean you spend five minutes on it. That means you look at what you played, what your opponent played, explore other possibilities that you were thinking of during the game or that you see in front of you. Really spend a lot of time and go over it. As far as I'm concerned, especially the amateur level, the most valuable study tool you have the most important thing you can do is to review your games with a chess engine. All right. I like to use Fritz. I've been using it for years. I think it's phenomenal. I love the layout because you know, what happens is you might do a postmortem with your opponent. For those of you who may be very new to the game, postmortem, as I'm sure you could probably figure out, that's where you go through the game with your opponent after it's over kind of a tradition in tournaments, it, it seems to be a bit of a dying art form. But anyway, I can't tell you how many times, myself included, where two amateurs will sit down and say something like, oh, yeah, Black had to play Rook F7 there. Oh, yeah, he had to play it. Yeah, you're losing. You had to play Rook F7. And then you put it in the engine, and you know Rook F7 is playable, but it's completely equal. Or in some cases, Rook F7 might have been a blunder. Or Rook F7 was one of like six other moves you could have played, you know, or instead of Rook F7, you had another move that created a mating net or one apiece, right? This happens all the time. So you need to go over it with a chess engine because often we get sort of blinders on, we get locked into this one set of thinking, but you need to spend time on that. Don't come home from the tournament hall and play five minute blitz games for three hours. All right, take a break or even better, wait till like the next day, you know, like step away from it. All right, it's like if you're a musician and you record something, you're better off stepping away from it and then listening to it because it's completely different because you have this emotional buildup because you just performed. Same thing if you're writing like a major term paper or thesis, like when you finally finish it, you don't want to proofread it right there. You need to step away from it. Same thing here, but you definitely need to look at your games with an engine. In my experience, I don't think people do that enough. They either throw out their score sheet in frustration if they lost, or if they made a gross blunder during the game, they'll just be like, well, I know where I went wrong. You know, I hung my knight. But in addition to looking at that, there might have been some other things, or there definitely will be some other things that you can look at to improve. So you need to review your games thoroughly with an engine. Very important. Let's now move on to number three. All right, for number three, there's quite a bit to unpack here. I don't want to say this is going to be a little controversial, but I'm just going to kind of put it out there. It's the idea that simply having a coach is going to mean instant improvement. Now, what do you mean by that? Some people might be struggling and they'll think, oh, I'm just going to get a coach, right? I'm a 1,200 player. I'm struggling. I'm like bouncing around between 1,200 and 1,250. I can't get better. I'm just going to get a coach and then I'll get to like 1,700 or something like that. Yes and no. Some people connect with the right coach and they do very well, but others don't. So for the few people that say, or or maybe it's a lot of people, I don't know know, the, the exact numbers, but just based on anecdotal evidence, You have people who, yes, who study with a coach and certainly they improve, but you hear many stories. I've heard this at the club. I've heard things online, spoken to people personally where they're quote unquote studying with a coach and they've had the same rating for years or months. Now, is that the coach's fault? 
No, not necessarily. I mean, of course, there are many, many phenomenal coaches out there, and there are many, I'm sure, who are not so great. But there's this mindset that just because you have a coach, you're automatically going to get better. You have to do what your coach tells you. You also have to connect with the coach and kind of be on the same page. If there's sort of tension there, it's not going to work out. So the coach could be phenomenal and the player could be very enthusiastic. But if there's a disconnect, you're not going to see improvement. And I think that's why many people who have a coach don't get better, but some do. And, you know, the ones that do oftentimes improve significantly. But if you're going to go the coach route, uh, the coach route, there we go, second time, you, you really need to make sure you're on the same page and that you are kind of in tune with each other, so to speak. Because if you're studying with a coach and it's, it's not connecting, you know, not only or from practically, you're going to be wasting a lot of money, but you're not going to get better. But I'm just amazed at how many people who are like, oh, yeah, I have a chess coach. And they've had the same rating for like years or months. So either you need to get a new coach or you need to fix whatever the disconnect is. But don't just think I'm going to study with a coach and boom, automatically, you know, it's like someone who says, well, I'm going to take guitar lessons. So, you know, within a year, I'm going to become the next Eddie Van Halen. It doesn't always work that way. So you need to put a lot of thought into the relationship you have with a coach. And after a period of time, really determine if it's helping you. Because the only loyalty, as far as I'm concerned, is to yourself. Now, full disclosure... I studied with the late I am Danny Kopeck. I've mentioned that a number of years ago. I studied with him for about a year or so, and I haven't had a coach since. So I'm not saying I'm an expert on this, but I'm just basing this on information people have told me. But when I worked with Danny, you know, we had we had a good relationship. I mean, we butt heads on a few things, but he really, really helped me a lot because the main problem for me was just, it it was a bit of nerves and just thinking, the thinking process. I was trading pieces incorrectly. Like it, it wasn't so much chess theory that I didn't know. It was just sort of the way I was interpreting the position. And he kind of cleaned that up a lot. And, and as a result that, you know, it helped me. But if we didn't connect, if we, if we didn't have that relationship, it may not have worked out. So the main point I'm making is that choosing a coach is a major decision, but don't assume you're going to improve simply because you're quote unquote taking lessons. All right. It's about the relationship you have with the coach, how in tune he is with your problems and whether or not you do the work. All right. So something to think about. And that brings us to the fourth reason why your rating may not be increasing. Number four is pretty straightforward as far as why your rating may not be going up. It's simply because you're not playing enough. And when I say not playing enough, I'm talking about live in-person games. Sure, internet chess will help you. And I know a lot of players do get strong from it. I think it's different for everybody. But you need to have a lot of playing experience with classical games in a live setting. Because in a live setting, you're dealing with, you know, touching the pieces and writing the moves down. It's true tournament conditions. And many players simply just do not have enough playing experience. There are some things, and Tim Mirabile, National Master, spoke about this at length. There are some things that you need to play through where studying alone is not going to clean them up. I mean, that's true for everything, right? Obviously, Whatever you study, you have to apply it on the board. That connection has to be there. But there are certain things as far as nerves and composure, we're going to get into that a little bit later, that you get from playing. And as far as not hanging pieces, as I mentioned before, you can study that up to a point, but ultimately a lot of your improvement is going to come from actually playing. Now, one thing I hear a lot of, I get this comment all the time at the club or I'll get emailed where it's like, Neil you know, when will I be ready to play in a tournament? You know, I'm kind of new or I'm an improver. When will I be ready? 
I go, there's no such thing as being ready. It's like, you, you're never ready to like buy your first house. You just have to jump in and do it. It's the same thing. You learn how to play in tournaments and get better at playing in tournaments by playing in tournaments. So I tell people, just jump in, just do it. You'll probably lose a lot of games right away. But taking those lumps and making those mistakes and, and that whole process, that's how you're going to get better. Okay. The, it's not like if you're new to the game, you can follow this formula at home and study these specific puzzles. And then you're going to go to your first tournament and get a 2000 rating. The best way is just to jump in. And what's great is we have many, many unrated newer players now at the club and they're having a great time and they're learning and they're actually doing fairly well considering their experience level or lack of it. But the best way is just to jump in. So again, really make sure that you are getting enough playing experience. Studying, of course, is essential, but that alone is not going to do it. And now let's move on to number five, the fifth reason why your rating may not be increasing. So the fifth reason your rating may not be increasing is because you're putting too much reliance on prep, on preparation, specifically opening preparation. Now, you, you may say, wait a minute, if you're taking time to prepare, isn't that going to help you? Yes, but there's a couple of things. People often, or amateurs, I should say, they think that because they quote unquote prep for the game or they prepared a certain opening, that their work is done. Like when you sit down to play, and this is something Brian Karen touched upon when I interviewed him, you, you still need to think, you know, you still need to play chess, but I feel like, you know, and I'm basing this on anecdotal evidence, people think that, oh, well, I prepared the opening so that, you know, they don't have to do any work at the board. That's not true. When you prep, that can sometimes cause people to get into this mindset that they're done, like all their thinking has been done for them already. No, you still need to play chess and make decisions, all right? And you can't think just because you quote-unquote prepped for your opponent that that's all you need to do. The other thing is, and I've said this before, I think the idea of prepping for specific opponents and prepping certain openings at the amateur level can be a little overrated. Now, I'm not talking about learning the opening in general. Obviously, you have to do that. But the problem is if you start to prepare or prep specific lines because you think your opponent's going to play it, when he doesn't play it, which happens quite often at this level, you now get frustrated and you're not flexible and you might try to force your prep in a position where it doesn't fit anymore. All right. You need to be flexible. And a lot of players don't do that. They try to force, well, I spent, you know, three hours or I spent a week preparing this line. I'm going to plow through with it. But the position doesn't call for that. Your opponent's playing something else. You need to respond to that and go in a different direction. So the whole idea of preparation is okay, but you have to be flexible if it goes in a different direction and you still have to think and make decisions on the board. You have to have a contingency plan. You got to be prepared for anything. You know, these amateur games can be a little crazy. Now, I believe in studying your openings. Absolutely. I spoke about that. My last two episodes were about openings. You need to know the ideas, themes, and whatever the theory is for your openings, of course. But at the amateur level, I think the idea of prepping for specific opponents is almost silly. Like if two 1,200 players are facing each other, like like really, you're going to prep for your opponent? Like the, the, there's going to be mistakes on both sides that it really doesn't matter. Even if two like eighteen or 1,900 players are going at it, you can talk about preparation, but even at that level, things can go in a different direction. So I'm not so sure how it helps. I don't really prep for specific opponents. All right, I don't do that. I mean, we use random pairings, so, you know, you never know who you're going to play. But even if it's in one of the later rounds and because of the way it's laid out, I know I would have to play a specific person. I really don't prep for specific opponents. Now, as you know, I play the same openings anyway, so my preparation is always the same. Like, if you play E4 
I'm playing E6 and going into the French, all right, regardless of who you are. Like that, that's the extent of my preparation. But in a way, that's a good thing because it, you know, I know exactly what I'm going to play. But preparing for specific opponents, I think that's a little unnecessary and overrated. That's just me. Other people are going to disagree, and that's fine. Now, the sixth reason why your rating may not be increasing is what I'm calling the at the board section. All right. So this is going to have several subsections. Okay. But all of this is under one category, which is really about what's happening at the board in terms of your choices and your interpretation. So this really has nothing to do with study time. I'll make some comments on that later. All right. But the first thing is that you don't want to play if you're tired or like you're stressed or if you're not focused. Now, that may seem obvious, but people do it anyway. It's far more important to get a good night's sleep before the game than it is to spend hours and hours prepping. All right. And that was an issue for me. I spoke about my rating swing where I was 1887. I went all the way down to 1600 my floor which you know was pretty irritating and now I'm back up to like 1730 so I'm chipping my way back to 1800 but a large reason I lost so many points is is that I was playing when my mind wasn't fully immersed in the game I had some other things going on I probably should have just stepped away from it but I insisted on playing and that's what happens all right so it's much more important that you're relaxed and that you're well rested than, you know, the amount of study time that you put in. The second idea to think about under this at the board category is composure or really a lack of it. Dealing with composure and nerves, very, very important because so many players, they study, they know the theory, they've worked things out, but then when they show up to the tournament hall, their composure and their nerves gets the best of them and that leads to impatience and forcing things and that type of thing. You need to bring a certain discipline and a certain amount of patience to the board because then all of your study time is going to be wasted because maybe at home you're taking your time, you're working things out, but then there's something about tournament conditions where you sit there and you feel almost impulsive and like I said, nervous And it's this impulsive reaction to your opponent's moves instead of taking your time. But that all stems from a lack of composure. And that's very, very important. And if that's something that you never fix, all the studying in the world is not going to help you. Now, the third thing in this category, as far as why your rating may not be increasing, is simply because of poor analysis or not being in tune with your opponent's ideas. Now, yes, you can study this to a certain degree. You can work on your exercises and your puzzles and your analysis skills, but you need to do it at the tournament. Many people do this at home, but then when they show up at the club to play, which is what it's all about, it doesn't quite come together. And it all stems from not playing defense. That's what this is. You want to call it analysis. You want to call it your opponent's ideas and being aware of your opponent's ideas, preventing counterplay, whatever label you want to put on it, ultimately it comes down to defense, right? Think of watching a sports game, right? Defense, defense. That's kind of how you have to think when you play a chess game. But I can tell you as a player, as a TD, as someone who runs a club, as someone who's worked with many adult beginners, nobody wants to play defense. Nobody wants to play defense. This is why your rating is not increasing. You need to play defense. You're so concerned about your own plans that you don't think about your opponent. And there are many cases where it's not even about analysis skills or, you know, any special chess knowledge. There there will be a simple threat where your opponent's threatening to take a pawn or something. You clearly see it, but yet you go forward with an attack or something when it's completely unjustified. Most of the time, you know, quite often, you just need to grit your teeth and just play simple defense. And often when you do that, like he's threatening a pawn, you defend, he usually doesn't know what the follow-up is many times. 
and people don't do it. I saw this the other night at the club, okay? There were a couple of games. My game finished early, so I was observing the games, which I love to do. And in one game, the player was threatening to take a pawn with check. It was very clear. You could tell from the opponent's eyes and just how he was studying the position that he saw it. I mean, it was very obvious. It wasn't subtle. But he ended up moving his rook, going for an attack, when all he had to do was just move his rook up three squares and defend the pawn. And he's fine. But as a result, he threw the game away. In another game, same night, a an opponent uh, didn't defend, excuse me, against a mating net. Okay, he went forward with his own plans. All he had to do was move his rook back to prevent the check, and he would have been fine. So in both cases, they just needed to play simple defense, and they would have been fine, but instead, they carried out with their own plans. Now, this stems from a lot of reasons. It could be the whole thing about composure and nerves and impatience and forcing things, but also a lot of it are the books and the puzzles we look at, because let's face it, It's the exciting games that make the cut where there's a threat, but the player ignores it and goes forward with a winning attack. Sure, that's correct sometimes, but more often than not, it isn't. And you can't emulate the books just because you saw it in a book. Everything is context dependent. So in a position you might have studied in a book or online, whatever it might be, the player may have ignored the threat to a pawn or a piece to play an offensive move, but it worked in that particular position, all right? Whereas in your position at the club, that may not be the case. And like I said, you just have to grit your teeth and just play tight defense, and then very often you'll be fine. But I think it's that whole copying of something that they saw in a book or something that causes the mistakes. But you you need to play defense. I mean, so often at the amateur level, there's a threat And it's an obvious one. And rather than defend it, you just get too fancy, right? I think in basketball, they call that, you know, too much French pastry. Simple defense is often very, very effective. You got to play defense. Remember, defense, okay? But I see this all the time. The fourth issue in this category is the failure to recognize transitions in the game and to adjust accordingly. In other words, you need to know when you're now in the middle game. The opening phase has ended, now you're in the middle game. And then the middle game ends, and you're in the end game. Because there are certain rules that apply to each one. For example, in the end game, I think most of you know your king becomes a very active piece, whereas in the middle game, you want a castle and shield your king from harm. You know, if the queens are on the board... That changes thing as, things uh, Excuse me, as well. For example, in opposite side castling, when the queens are on the board, it's often a big struggle who, who will get to the king first. But if the queens are removed from the board in an opposite side castling thing, you know, then you're pretty much in an end game or close to it, that type of thing. But some people don't make those transitions. They're in an end game but they're still acting like it's the middle game. So you need to stop, maybe get up from the board and reset if necessary, but really be aware of those transitions. I suggest when there's a clear inflection point in the game that you get up from the board, kind of reset and come back, even if it's just for like 30 seconds. When I say get up from the board, I'm not talking about for 10 minutes because I know the clock is ticking, but you need to do that. All right, the last thing in this section, number five, is that you need to eradicate any harmful quirks or bad habits. And I'll explain what I mean by that. I'll give a few examples because if you don't do that, again, as with most of this stuff, all the studying in the world won't help you. And it could just be one little thing you're doing that can plateau your rating for quite some time. For example, There's one player I know who is always rushing his moves, especially in the earlier part of the game. It's like this impulsive thing. Now, I don't know if it's an ego thing. Well, he made a move, so I'm going to move fast as if to say, ha, you know, you didn't fool me, that type of thing. Or maybe your opponent's moving a little quickly, so you feel the need to move quickly as well. 
maybe it's just the nerves thing. I'm not sure. But if he were to slow down, like I'm not exaggerating here. If he were to really slow down and be more deliberate in his thinking and his analysis and just not move so fast, his rating would be 200 points higher. Like for real, not 50 points. I seriously believe it would be 200 points higher because I can tell from his play, he has the skills and the knowledge, but when he's sitting down at the board, he just gets into this mode where he just rushes. And yes, you need time for the end game. I get it, but it needs to be a balance, right? You don't want to play so fast that you end up having, I don't want to say they have too much time, but you want to use your time. Your time is there for you to use. I guess the best way to put it, if you end the game with a half hour or 40 minutes left on your clock, it's not like you get a prize. That's 40 minutes that you could have used. Now, on the other hand, we're talking about quirks. We have one player at the club, younger player, very thoughtful. Now, for a younger player, he's very thoughtful, very patient, very mature chess. You usually don't see that in like a teenager, but he'll take like 15 minutes on like move four. You can't be doing that either. That's the other extreme. In a typical club control, ours is game 90, you know that, with a 10 second delay, you can't be taking 12 minutes, 15 minutes on a move, especially move four. Now, the only time you should do that is if it's like a really thorny tactical position or something really critical. All right, but obsessing, you know, do I put the knight on this square or on that square, or do I move my A rook to the open file, or, you know, my H rook to the open file, that type of thing, it, it's going to cause problems, that type of, you know, obsessive perfectionism. But getting back to this one player, he's got to stop rushing his moves and playing so impulsively, because it's killing his rating. And that's an example of a, like an individual quirk that a player has. To use the other player, if he keeps taking, you know, 12, 15 minutes on an opening move where there's nothing crazy, no, no tactics, it's not like the opponent did something special, that's going to hurt him as well. Clock management is huge, all right, as, as uh, what is it, Chess for Tigers, that's the book by Simon Webb. I spoke about that, Chess Psychology book. As he says, if you're dealing with time issues or clock management issues, just as an example, nothing else in your game really matters because you're always going to have problems. So that's an example of an individual quirk, but you need to identify what that is and you need to fix it because as I said, if you keep doing it, you keep making that same mistake, your rating's not going to increase. And this kind of meshes with what I said earlier about a chess coach, where I know I said that some people study with a coach and may not improve, but others do. But one of the most important reasons for you to get a coach and, you know, what a good coach should be able to do is to identify those quirks. It might just be one or two things, but the players who have a coach and do improve, like they start studying with a coach and there's a dramatic increase in their rating. In my opinion, it's usually because the coach identified the little quirk or quirks that that player had. It's not so much because the coach introduced them to a new opening or gave them tactical exercises. It's because the coach was able to pinpoint the specific issue or issues that keep plaguing the player because, you know, we're biased towards ourselves. You may have this quirk or this uh, error prone way of thinking, whatever it might be, but you don't recognize it because it's yourself. And that's where a good coach comes in. Unfortunately, many times it doesn't work out that way. And the player studies with a coach and doesn't improve, but that's really the main purpose of coaching. As far as I'm concerned is to, you know, bolster the strengths, but eliminate the weaknesses. And the first step is to identify what those are. All right. A good coach is going to find those and eradicate them. A bad coach is not going to be able to identify those problems. All right, so I just wanted to throw that in there. So to wrap this up, you'll notice most of these concepts I mentioned as far as why your rating is not increasing are really procedural things or things related to tournament conditions and preparation mindset 
that type of stuff, like individual, you know, idiosyncrasies or quirks. I probably use that word quirks too much, but you get the idea. And as I said more than once, all of the studying in the world, in my opinion, is not going to help if one or more of these problems exist. And again, and this is crucial, all it takes is for one of these problems to exist, just one of them, and that can be enough for your rating to plateau or not increase or in some cases decrease. And again, I'm not sitting on my high horse when I say this. These are issues I struggle with myself, and it's my understanding even titled players struggle with these ideas as well. I mean, it's, of course, on a completely different level than the way we experience it, but in their own way and on their own level, they experience these issues as well. But again, you know, just in a different way. But at the amateur level, these problems are certainly prevalent on a regular basis, and hopefully I've given you something to think about other than actual chess theory as far as why you might be having trouble improving. Now I'm going to leave you with a quote from the great American Grandmaster Larry Evans, which might be the answer to amateur chess. I think he solved the issue of improvement at the amateur level with this one quote, and here it is. It's far more important not to do anything stupid than to create brilliant combinations beautiful quote that's GM Larry Evans and that just goes to what I've been talking about about not forcing things and just playing simply and straightforward and you know waiting for a mistake the late great GM Evans is absolutely correct just don't do anything stupid don't force things and you would be amazed at how many games you'll win with that attitude just throwing it out there as always we really appreciate you listening appreciate the support We have two more episodes of this season. As of right now, I'm going to be flying solo next week. We have a special guest, barring any unforeseen circumstances, for our season finale. That should be great. And as always, I hope you win your next game. Have a great day, everybody.